Appropriation is a term that has been used more and more within the last about uh, 10 years or so, and usually when it's said, it's in reference to cultural appropriation. However, that is not the only appropriation that can actually happen. Uh, this week I'm going to be talking about the differences between artistic appropriation and cultural appropriation. Before I get into the actual contents of this video, I am going to warn you that you will be seeing some racist imagery in this video. Starting off with some basic definitions, uh, imperialism is a policy of extending a country's power or influence through diplomacy or military force. This is also uh, usually done to like gain some sort of access to raw materials or trade resources. Appropriation is the act of taking something that does not belong to you, usually with the uh without permission of the person who originally had it uh this is usually in reference to a uh not really like a physical thing but more so to like an idea or the usage of something orientalism is an art style representing asia especially the middle east uh in a stereotypical way uh, it's usually done for again imperialistic or colonialist uh ideas so it like perpetrates this idea that like these places are so exotic or maybe they're so dangerous that we should be fascinated with them. Japanese Bay is a Euro-American fascination with the usage of Japanese art and culture. Uh, it was made popular largely in the 1800s. Starting off with imperialistic endeavors, Japan had chosen to be almost entirely closed off from the rest of the world until American Commodore Matthew Perry traveled to Japan to negotiate with the Tokugawa shogunate and uh, basically like force them to open back up because he went there, like it sounds like it was just a negotiation but he went there with gunboats like they didn't really have much of a choice other than to be like yeah I guess we'll open back up And that brings us into Edo art and culture. So the Edo period was a period in Japan between uh, 1615 and 1885. During this time, the government of Japan was ruled by the, again, I already said it, the Tokugawa shogunate. During this time, samurai were the highest class in society with most of them living in residential areas like uh, cities like Edo, uh, with the majority of the population living either in the outskirts of cities or in the countryside. Uh, throughout the Edo period, one of the most popular art styles was Yukio. Uh, this art style was characterized by floating figures, solid backgrounds, flat colors or patterns, asymmetry, and diagonal compositions. Uh, most of the artwork during this period would depict urban Japanese culture, uh, basically the places where those samurai or higher class people lived, and it uh, included a lot of Japanese cultural activities such as kabuki theater, tea ceremonies, sumo wrestling, erotica, nature, and just like people in cities going about their business. Uh, going back to international trade, since Yukio was the most popular art style in Japan at the time, a majority of the wood blocks that would be exported from Japan featured that art style. This led many uh, Western artists to begin experimenting with Japanese scenery and art styles. Uh, this is also where we get the conversation into what is artistic appropriation and what is cultural appropriation. Uh, we already defined appropriation as a broad concept earlier, but now I'm going to be talking about these specific examples of cultural appropriation and artistic appropriation. Cultural appropriation is when someone takes a cultural attire or maybe something used by a specific group of people and uh, basically claims it for their own. It usually is done either for their own personal gain or to portray a sort of caricature. Uh, an example of when someone has done it for their own social gain is uh, Kim Kardashian, uh, who has been known for many years to appropriate black culture, and Social Repos, who has been known for wearing a, like, goth Lakota warrior headdress. An example of when it has been done to make a caricature of the original culture would be uh, Logan Paul when he visited Japan and wore a kimono and was just awful the entire time he was there. Um, another example is not really specific, but in general, like there's a stereotype of white women who like align their chakras and they burn white sage and like collect crystals and they're super like zen and they wear cultural attire even though they are not immersed in the culture in any way and they just they generally get made fun of a lot uh but the thing is is that when you make fun of the person and you make fun of what they are doing you're also kind of making fun of that you know what i mean so when you make fun of white women for appropriating a specific culture 
you're also kind of making fun of that culture. Uh, which isn't to say that you shouldn't make fun of these people, but it should be very clear that you're making fun of the person and not the culture. Uh, artistic appropriation, however, is very different. Artistic appropriation is when an artist takes a work of art or an aspect of someone else's art and uses it in a different way. There are several examples of this, but I'm going to try and uh, cover two specific ones. An example of cross-cultural appropriation, uh, artistic appropriation, and uh, not cross-cultural artistic appropriation. So uh, in Hinduism, when an important person dies and is cremated, a structure is usually erected at the site of cremation and it is called a chhatri. Uh, chhatris are domed canopies, usually made of red sandstone because that is in abundance in India. The Mughal Empire was the longest reigning Muslim empire in India. It lasted from 1526 to 1857. The people of the Mughal Empire uh, came from many areas in Central Asia, but largely uh, they were Persian, meaning, you know, not Indian, is what I'm trying to get at here. Uh, covering a specific instance of artistic appropriation during this time, Shah Jahan was the Mughal Empire emperor from 1628 to 1656. During this time, his favorite wife, Mumtaz Mahal, Mahal, get it? Uh, died. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Jahan commissioned for a mausoleum to be built in her honor, uh, but it actually really wasn't just a mausoleum. Uh, it actually included a lot of different places, including like a guest house, uh, like there was a swimming pool, I think, um, and like a shopping area. There was also a mosque there, which is pretty cool. But yeah, overall, it served as a mausoleum for his wife. It actually it holds his body as well. Where artistic appropriation comes into play with the Taj Mahal is specifically on its roof or the ceiling. Uh, so the top of the Taj Mahal, if you've never seen the Taj Mahal before, I guess, like haven't seen a picture of it or anything, uh, there's a dome on top, right? And then next to the dome, there are four like kind of like little domes, like they kind of look like gazebos and those are chhatris. Uh, so basically what happened is that the person who was building the Taj Mahal, uh, either uh, Jahan himself or, I mean, he wouldn't have been building it, he was an emperor, but uh, <laughs> him or the person who designed the Taj Mahal probably saw chhatris and thought that they were very nice and decided to include them. The reason that this isn't uh, cultural appropriation but is instead artistic appropriation is because they took something, they took a specific design and implemented it into something larger. So if Jahan had taken his wife's body and cremated it and then erected a chhatri after she was cremated, that would be an example of, our, of cultural appropriation because he's basically directly taking something from Hindu culture and claiming it as his own. But in this instance, it is actually artistic appropriation because he took something from another culture, he, he took an artistic element from another culture and made it something else. Now let's move on to an instance of artistic appropriation that is not cross-cultural. Uh, Michelangelo was a Renaissance sculptor born in 1475. He was known for many works such as the Sistine Chapel, David, Bacchus, and many more. Uh, one well-known sculptor of his was called Our Lady of Piety or La Pieta. Uh, it was in completed in 1499, and I do want to kind of make it clear that uh, a pieta is not like, it, like his sculpture is a pieta, it is not the pieta technically, because a pieta is just any description of Mary holding Jesus after he was crucified. However, uh, what makes Michelangelo's Pieta so different from any of the others is the uh, iconography that goes into it and the fact that it was like, it was iconic, it was very well known. Um, and this is because of the way that both the figures are portrayed. Jesus is emaciated, he is uh, laying limp in his mother's arms, he is clearly dead. Which in a lot of other uh, descriptions of Jesus and being held by Mary after he was died, he has been... Uh, He's been like, you know, kind of rough looking, but this specific way that it was done was something that was like, fucking, it was crazy. <laughs> like it was like, like people like thought it was sick. And then Mary holds him gracefully in her arms and is mourning, but she's not like distraught. She is just sort of calmly looking down at her son who she raised, you know, for 30 years of his life and now he's dead. And we can see many instances of this uh, work being appropriated by other artists. Uh, one example would be Raphael's Madonna of the Goldfinch. In this painting, we can see uh, Mary Hold, uh, sort of holding out her arms. She's not holding Jesus, but she is holding out her arms and looking down in a very similar manner. And we see a uh, little baby Jesus at her knee and he's holding up his hand and his head is kind of tilted back and it sort of emulates how he looks in Michelangelo's sculpture. Uh, not only that, this whole painting actually is foreshadowing for the fact that Jesus is going to die, but 
we don't have time to get into that. Uh, now that we've covered the differences between artistic appropriation and cultural appropriation, I'm going to get into Orientalism and Japanese May. Uh, Japanese May uh, specifically resulted from Japan exporting goods to the West, uh, which resulted in a, an increased, um, you know, interest in Japanese art and culture, specifically Japanese art style and culture. However, with Orientalism, uh, it is a direct depiction of oriental life, you know, of eastern life by European artists. So instead of like a Japanese person making a print and then selling that print to Westerners, this is a Westerner who has maybe gone to this place or read about this place and is depicting what they think it represents and then sending it back or just showing it to people. So overall, you don't really get this like intense look or you don't really get an accurate betrayal of what it is like to actually be in these areas. It is more so just like a surface level look in at what it is like to maybe be there or what this person just thinks it might be like to be there because not all orientalist painters even went to the countries that they described which is kind of messed up i feel like like you should you know i've just <laughs> i just feel like you should not be allowed to do that <laughs> So as I previously described, uh, this means that the main difference between Orientalism and Japanese May is that orient Orientalism was a characterization of how Westerners viewed Eastern cultures by society, while Japanese May was largely uh, characterized by an interest in wanting to actually learn more about Japanese art and culture. Also, the art that was portraying these places was made by people who were actually from the places. Both Orientalism and Japanese May resulted in uh, Westerners appropriating the cultures that were described, but they happened in very different ways. Uh, so with the rise of Orientalism, many Victorian women began to don turbans. Uh, turbans are, for one thing, usually worn by men, but they were also worn for largely religious purposes or to indicate social status or special occasions. While with the rise of Japanese May, people began to don kimono, which is traditional attire. However, it is not used to indicate religion or social status, even though if you are like a higher class, you could wear like a nicer kimono. In general, it is, a, it is something that can be worn by pretty much everyone, especially even Westerners, really, um, as long as it's worn, obviously, in a respectful way. But this is where the question arises when we talk about Japanese May art is, uh, is it respectful? Is it a uh, good interpretation of Japanese culture or is it not? Is it artistic appropriation or is it cultural appropriation? And the answer to that is both, yes and no. Much like the cultures that were depicted by Orientalists and Japanese May artists, uh, Western painters are not a monolith, meaning that some Western painters did use uh, Japanese May as a means of creating something new as using it for artistic appropriation, and some of them did it for cultural appropriation. So let's take a look at an example of artistic appropriation. Mary Cassatt was an American Impressionist painter born in 1844. Cassatt was inspired by Japanese woodblock prints and the Yukio art style, and made several prints of her own. In fact, uh, one of these prints was called The Fitting, and it was completed in 1891. This painting has several clear features uh, similar to those seen in Japanese woodblock prints. Uh, specifically, there are uh, flat colors and um, simplified sort of facial features. There's also uh, sustained background patterns, which means that like the background pattern doesn't really like move with the wall in a sense. Like with this line, you can see that it sort of like drifts a little bit as it goes backwards. But with patterns that were displayed on the wall and on the floor, especially in this painting, uh, they are not. However, uh, this painting was made its own work uh, while still using Japanese style in the fact that both of these women are clearly uh, Westerners. We can see that from the facial uh, features of the woman who is facing towards us. And even in the woman facing away from us, we can see that they are wearing, you know, Western European attire. Um, there's also the fact that the pattern on their clothing does fold and, uh, you know, bends to the will of the fabric instead of actually just being this flat um, pattern like a lot of Yukio art would be. From this, we can tell that this painting is in fact artistic appropriation and not cultural appropriation. Speaking of which, let's get into a painting that is not as nice to look at. Claude Monet was a French Impressionist painter born in 1840. Monet was most known for his Impressionist landscapes and boat paintings. Uh, Monet often included people in his paintings. However, you usually could not see what they looked like other than like maybe their outfits. And even then, it kind of just sometimes if they were far away enough just kind of looked like a little splotch. So it depends. 
He did absolutely do portraits, they're just not as well known. Uh, one specific portrait that he did was called La Japonaise, and it is a portrait of a woman in a kimono posed with a fan with several more fans posed behind her. And some not so fun facts about this work is that the kimono she is wearing is from Japan, however it is a men's kimono and likely belonged to Monet. Uh, the woman in the painting is turned around to us to clearly express her European features. Not only that, but the worst fact about this painting is the fact that this woman is Camille Monet, Monet's wife, and she had naturally dark hair. As you can see in the painting, she is wearing a blonde wig, which means that Monet had her put on this wig in order to indicate that this is very clearly a Western person wearing a kimono and holding this fan with a bunch of other fans in the background, basically like just donning Asian culture, like uh, Japanese culture specifically, but basically just donning this culture and putting it on like for dress up purposes. Not only that, but there is like relatively no inclusion of Japanese art styles in this painting. Uh, it is just simply a character of Japanese culture. That being said, this is not artistic appropriation. It is a documented instance of cultural appropriation. That being said, this video is by no means trying to say that like, uh, you know, artistic appropriation is always good and cool and awesome and you should do it. That's not what I'm saying at all. I think that certain aspects of artistic appropriation can be absolutely very strange. I personally think putting Chaudhry's on top of your mausoleum is a little weird, but you know, it's not as bad as running around in a headdress or a kimono and acting like a jackass. Uh, all in all, I hope that you enjoyed this video. Uh, I personally kind of like the idea of switching off between like art video, politics, art video. I know that this video did have some politics in with it as well, but I, then again, art is very political. So, you know, what can you say? Um, but if you like this video, feel free to like and subscribe. Also, if you have anything you want to say to me, leave it down in the comment section below. And if you have any ideas for future videos, uh, be sure to either comment it or you can message me on Twitter. Um, yeah, bye.